Hey everyone, this is Jordan from PictureMonk.com and welcome to, I think it's 78, episode 78 of the podcast. Uh, and this one's kind of, this one's kind of fun, I think. It's, uh, it's, it's all about organization, really. Not really. Um, but it's, it's a, a episode all about, uh, all about Lightroom workflows and how to improve them. But before we get into the episode, uh, one thing I want to say is just thank you, thank you, thank you so much for the response that I've got in the uh, the Road to Full Time series that I uh, uh, the episode that I just released on the YouTube channel. If you haven't seen it yet, go to uh, picturemonk.com slash YouTube. That'll take you to the YouTube channel. You can subscribe there to see it. Um, but it's it was actually a very very good response. Uh, everybody seems to enjoy it, even though it was kind of a smaller episode. Uh, and and just going forward. I have a whole lot of episode ideas that I have, uh, but this one I really didn't know exactly how to display it. I didn't know how I wanted to actually show it to you guys, uh, how I wanted to edit the video, um, and all that kind of stuff. So I think I have kind of a, a smaller grasp of, of what I want to kind of narrow down, and and I, I think it's going to be a, a great thing. I already have the second episode running. Um, I, I got it editing and, and everything like that, so it's almost done. So I can probably hopefully release that sometime next week, uh, just to make sure I got all the all the little bits in there that I wanna that I wanna throw in. But uh, this one was kind of a pilot episode. I, I kind of talked about about that on the Facebook page. So uh, thank you guys anyway for the response to that. I know it was a very short one, but the next one I'm planning on it being a little bit longer and have a little bit more uh, a little a little bit more meat in the video, so you guys can kind of get a feel for what's going on. Uh, but just thank you so much. Uh, I'm I'm really glad you guys like it because I liked making it. Uh, I like the shooting of it. I like the editing of it and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, gosh, it was just fun to, uh, fun, fun to, to do. And I'm, I'm hoping more will come, uh, so I can keep continuing to do this more and more. So thank you again. And, uh, let's go ahead and get into the episode here. Uh, I'm going to start out the episode with the listener question of the week. Um, and this one is from Rebecca in Los Angeles, California. And Rebecca writes, uh, every time I fly my drone, I lose signal, and when it is far away from me, uh, ooh, this was written really weird, I lose signal, and when it is far away from me, I can still see it, but the transmission's end, what am I doing? Okay, broken sentence, so, <laughs> so please next time, uh, please next time go ahead and uh, kind of double check that, but I think what you're trying to say is, uh, when it's not far away from you, because yeah, if it's far away from you, you're probably going to lose a little bit of signal. Um, but one thing that I've found, uh, when it comes to especially flying the drone around my area is there's tons and tons of trees. Uh, and so the, 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 the phantoms, uh, this, uh, talking in particular to the one I have, the, the phantoms, they have really ridiculous range. I mean, you can fly them a long, long way, uh, especially the ones with that light bridge technology. Um, but if it kind of gets something in the way of it, you're going to not be able to fly it that far, far from you. Um, it's kind of that whole line of sight thing. So I've noticed that, uh, I, I was, I was flying it and I, I, I tried to fly it pretty straight, straight away from me. Um, especially at, let's, let's take for instance, my, my, my backyard here, I'll launch it in my backyard and I can fly, um, like on one end, there's like a, a a golf course separated by trees, and then the other end is a bunch of other houses. If I fly it over the trees uh, and kind of down the way, I can fly it a lot longer there. But as soon as I go uh, the other way where the houses are, I it kind of goes over my house. I lose uh, signal really quick. I can probably go half the distance as I would if I flew it over trees. Um, so that's one thing to kind of consider there. I, I was in a field, um, flying it one time and I flew it really far away, like past the max, max distance that was set. Um, I, I, I turned it off and flew far away from it. Um, and it was still going, still going. I still had a clear signal, not even, not even a blip of a weak signal. Um, and it, uh, and it could still keep going farther. And that's because there was a field with nothing in it. So I could clearly see, uh, the, the controller could clearly see, uh, the signal going to the drone. And so just kind of pay attention to the, the, the trees and, uh, little things in your area that could kind of separate that. Uh, one other small thing that this actually happened to me, the, I think it was the second time that I flew my drone. Uh, the little antennas. I'm only talking about the DJI because uh, that's the one that I have and that's the one I have experience with. Uh, but one time I forgot to fold my antennas out. The two antennas that are on the side, uh, they were still crossed. And so when I took it out of my bag, I, I forgot to do that. And so it, it lost signal really, really quick. Uh, probably, 
uh, I think I flew it up to like 250, uh, 250 feet above me, just straight above me, and it lost. It was getting weak signal. As soon as I fanned those antennas out, it was really like night and day. It just went boom, and then there was the clear signal again. And so just make sure you do that too. I know I know it's a weird, simple thing, but that's something that definitely happens to me a lot. So uh, so thank you, Rebecca, for the question. Uh, let's go ahead and get into the topic this week. I have uh, kind of a news-ish article that I want to talk about, but I'm saving that for the uh, widget of the week at the bottom of the episode. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into the topic. So as I mentioned, uh, the topic is kind of about workflows, and I kind of want to go over a couple, a couple, you know, seven, seven-ish facts or seven-ish tips that I use to kind of enhance my workflow, uh, because I've had a lot of response of saying, how do you deliver uh, when it comes to the real estate stuff? How do you deliver your photos uh, that night, edited and everything? How do you, how do you do that? And so I wanted to kind of run through that real quick. So the first thing I do is organize my catalog. Uh, it took me a very long time because I was just throwing all my folders or photos into one folder when I first started. And uh, that kind of got a little messy, as you would imagine. And so I started to reorganize my catalog, which took a very, very long time. And I think I kind of finally got it down. So I kind of wanted to go over the structure of how I import my photos and, and the, the folder structure real quick. So... The first thing I do is I have folders for uh, the year. So I kind of go, you know, I think mine starts in 2015 or 14 or something like that, back when I first got Lightroom. So I changed everything over to 2014. And so I have a folder for 2014, 15, 16, and now 17. And uh, so so I have, they're all separated in those folders. So as soon as you go into the one of the folders, then you go into a subject. So in the subject, I mean uh, landscape, portraits, I got family, um, I got, uh, you know, trains and planes and stuff like that. Um, uh, just miscellaneous stuff. I even have a folder for maybe tutorials that I might record for you guys, uh, stuff like that. So it goes into another folder. Then it goes into an event inside that subject folder. And so the event would be, uh, let's say take for real estate, for example, the real, the event folder would be the address of the house that I shot. And so uh, I would go into the real estate folder and then in the address you would see 123 Main Street, 124 Main Street, 125 Main Street, that kind of thing. And then in those folders are where the files, uh, the actual images live. And so that's where I put everything in there. I used to have a folder called, uh, and I, I still do just to play around with, but I used to have a folder, uh, now that I have a drone, just called Aerial Photos. And that's where all the aerial photos would go, even if they were for real estate. But I found that to get a little messy because I would be thinking I had an aerial shot of a place and I knew I had it, but it wasn't in that address folder. So I'd have to go back and find it. So now everything, even even if it's shot on different cameras and everything, everything goes into that one folder uh, for that that event. And so, uh, so I make sure to have everything in there. And that way I know, uh, you know, by chance, uh, this will never happen. I'm almost positive. But by chance, if someone says, Hey, I, you shot a house for me back in 2015. Uh, did you, uh, do you happen to still have those files? And I ha- happen to keep those files, most of them. And so I will, you know, go to my 2015 folder. I'll ask what the address was. Um, and then find the address, send them the folder, uh, the photos. And there you go. We're done. And so that's kind of a, s- a very simple way, but it's, it's, a, it's a simple thing that not a lot of people do. And it took me a while to realize why I needed to do it. But now it feels so good to have all my my catalog organized, especially since I changed computers. Uh, and it wasn't, uh, you know, I just had the, the Mac mirror to another Mac. And it was nice to have to make sure that, you know, all my stuff was compact, organized, ready to go. And so if you haven't organized your catalog, I know it's going to be a beast of a process, um, but it would be something beneficial to do. Even if you don't, if even if you, you know, can't take four days to just sit down and do it, a little bit at a time is not going to hurt just to kind of try to organize, move some folders, move some files around, stuff, that, that kind of thing. All right, the next topic is going to be import presets. I think I talk about these a lot. I actually might combine this one. It's import and export presets. And so the import presets I use uh, all the time. I have those basically by default set. And so what the import preset is, is that I have, uh, especially for real estate stuff, I kind of have one for real estate standard uh, and then uh, landscape standard and stuff like that. And so they are presets that I develop to um, do certain things depending on the subject. So again, for real estate purposes, um, I will have a preset, a import preset that will automatically enable the camera profile that will uh, do an auto transform to make sure the lines are straight and kind of remove distortion a little bit, uh, increase the vibrance, decrease the highlights a little bit, increase the shadows a little bit, um, and then do a little bit of clarity and 
There was one more that I don't remember. I think it was maybe and bump up the exposure just a little bit. Um, and then when, when all those files are being imported, that preset is applied to all of those images upon import. So those are basically the same things that I, the same settings that I use, uh, for, for almost every folder or every fo photo that I pop into Lightroom. So might as well have Lightroom do it for me. And so, uh, that's how, that's one reason why I'm able to edit my photos so quickly is just to, because it because Lightroom is doing the edit for me, and so I'll after the edit uh, the import is in there, I'll go back and look at the files, and uh, do minor adjustments to them. Uh, you know, my, I might have to take a brush to them at some point and uh, do a little bit of dodging and burning and stuff. But most of the the heavy editing is done uh, once I pop it into Lightroom. And so I said I was going to talk about export presets as well. Uh, export presets, uh, especially again, I'm probably going to just talk about real estate in this just because it kind of makes more sense with most of this stuff. Um, but for export presets, I have uh, three different sizes for export presets and I can actually pull up my Lightroom here and I will kind of go over those real, real quick. Um, but for when I export real estate stuff, for example, I have three different sizes and, uh, what I'll do is I have an export preset set there. It'll automatically name the folder, um, by a name that I type in and then it'll size them down to whatever size I say. And so the sizes I have are, uh, the first one is kind of a smaller size. Most no, you know, nobody or labor uses this, but it's good to give them cause it's an MLS size is a 660 by 440 at two, uh, 72 resolution, 72 uh, PPI resolution. Uh, the next one is 1800 by 1200 at 220 uh, PPI. And the next one is three uh, 3600 by 2400 at 300 DPI. And so I'll, I'll uh, highlight all the folders or all the, all the files, do an export preset for the uh, 660 by 440, let that do its thing, and then I'll do another one for uh, same same images, 18 uh, 1800 by 1200, and then the next one 3600 by 2400, and then those folder or those files are all in a group, uh, they're all in one, uh, they're each individual folder, and that's what I give to whoever needs them, and so it saves me from having to you know type in all the different values and where it's going to, where it's going to export to and all that kind of stuff. It saves me from naming all of them. And so it's, it's, it's just a quicker way to get the people what they need when, uh, when you're done with the, with the project. So, uh, that's a real quick example there of the import and export presets. Another one is rating your full, uh, your, your files, uh, your photos. So I will, once, once I pop in my photos into Lightroom, um, you know, everybody does this. <laughs> Even I do it sometimes where, uh, I'll take a image. I'll, I'll take a shot of something, let's say a living room or something like that. And I will probably take the exact same angle, uh, the exact same composition, almost maybe like a few inches, uh, to the left or the right or something like that. But I will take the same image probably like three times and I have no, no reason to do it. I mean, I might look at the back of the camera. The first one I'll be like, that looks really good. And then I think I'm going to get a different result, but I never do. It's just the same photo over and over again. And so what I'll do is I'll go through my Lightroom and I'll star, uh, the ones that are the final ones that I'm going to, I'm, I'm definitely going to edit and I'll star them a five star rating. And then, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll filter. Lightroom to only show me the five stars and then that's when I'll go back and edit the uh, the files and so that kind of helps me with well having to see a bunch of junk down at the bottom in your timeline so you can uh, kind of concentrate on the ones you need to edit and so I'm going to get into five stars here in the next tip and that is uh, smart collections. Uh, smart collections are uh, really awesome. I really love smart collections now that I've actually found a really cool use for for using them. Uh, what I'll do is I'll uh, I'll, I'll make a smart collection. If you go into your library, uh, library, library module in Lightroom, you can set up a smart collection and you kind of give parameters on what you want it to do. So a uh, smart collection is basically a, a collection of stuff that will automatically, automatically compile basically. So, uh, one of the smart collections that I use, uh, especially for this year is the 2017, uh, five stars. And so after I get rid of, uh, you know, after I export my, my photos and deliver them to the client, I will reset all of my, um, all of my images back to zero stars. And then I'll go back through. And if I find some that are really awesome, that are really, really, really love, I'll edit it back or I'll, 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 I'll flag it back to being five stars. And what the smart collection will do is it'll automatically put that photo in a collection that you specify. And so that collection will be, in this case, 2017 five stars. 
And the reason why I'm doing that is because at the end of 2017, I want to see all my five-star images, and that way I can filter down to see my best of the best and everything like that. And so that's the main reason why I do that. You can do other things. You can set it up to be uh, 2017 portraits, uh, top portraits or something like that. And if you're a portrait photographer, you're going around and you, oh, I took this picture of a newborn. It's really awesome. I'll five star it. And then you can see these five star images that are, that you consider the best. And so that's one reason why I use smart collections. It's just a, a really good way to, in a way, stay organized, but in a way to show you, um, to show you what you want to see at a certain time. So if somebody wants to see all my awesome photos by chance. Uh, they can, they can, I, I can open that folder up and boom, there you go. I got all my, all my five star photos. And so next one, the next kind of topic here is the, uh, sky gradient filter preset. And I have a warm and a cool. And so what I mean by that is there are tons of times, especially for all outdoor photos, most likely, uh, I will create a, a gradient. Uh, a sky gradient where I'll pull a, pull the gradient down from the top into the image and kind of play with the the colors to kind of um, kind of darken the sky a little bit because most of the time you know if you're if you're shooting on evaluative mode in your camera it's kind of averaging out and a lot of time your sky might be blown out in certain spots uh, but so what I'll do is I'll have a preset a gradient preset made. So that way, if I want to just automatically pop in a, uh, a gradient to, to the top of the image, I have a warm and a cool. And what it'll do is automatically apply the preset there. And then I can, you know, kind of tone down the sky a little bit or tone it up or, or do anything like that. And the reason why I do that is because most of the time on outdoor images, that's what I do to kind of bring out a little bit of the sky. And so instead of drawing it out every time that I have a photo, I just pop that preset and there it is. And so you can easily do that by, um, just taking an image, drawing out the uh, the gradient that you want, and create a preset for it. But make sure you uncheck everything uh, except for that uh, that uh, gradient tool filter, because uh, what that'll do is if you don't uncheck that, then every edit you make, or when you go to another photo, it's going to erase every edit that you've done and apply just that filter. And so you want to you want to make sure it's just only applying that filter when you need it to. And so that's one thing that I do to kind of kind of kind of speed up the workflow a little bit and it has helped a lot. And the next last uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about is a smart and regular collection. So I talked about uh, or I talked about uh, smart collection before that I'm actually going to talk about quick collections and regular collections. So regular collections uh, real quick are just a, a folder that you put your photos in. That's all they are. It's just a fancy word for folder. And so uh, I'll I'll take my images uh, kind of like how I I I uh, put them into a folder uh, when I imported them for the real estate stuff. I'll also make a collection for it just in case. So I need to get to it real quick and I'll keep it for a couple months or something like that. Then I'll just remove the collection. And what that allows me to do is just kind of move the, fo- the the files around. So when I deliver to l- deliver them to the client, um, they, they're in order. So, the, you know, you walk in, you got the living room, you got the kitchen and everything. They're not seeing like the back, the backyard first and they have to reorganize them. I'm organizing them for them. And so that's basically all that is. I, I make sure to use that just, to, just in case, but a, a quick collection is actually a collection that I use pretty, pretty often. Uh, and what a quick collection is done is like a temporary folder. A uh, quick collection is basically you can put some stuff into a quick collection and it kind of just remains there until you don't need it anymore. And then you can just remove it. It's, it's a, a quicker way to do a regular collection. <laughs> but the reason why, why I might do that is if, if somebody came to me and said, Hey, I like this shot of the, uh, the, let's say the, the bathroom or something like that. But can you, I, I've noticed there's like a shampoo bottle or something. Can you take that out of the shower? Um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll, you know, open it up in Lightroom or whatever, and then I'll take that photo, that photo and put it into a quick collection, maybe with a couple other examples and then send that. So that way I don't have to create a separate collection and move the files around. Um, I can just put it in a quick collection as a temporary holding spot and then export the files, give them to the client and then they're done. So, uh, make sure you just use collections. I think this should have been a whole episode on collections, but, but uh, I really use collections a lot and all the other tips are really great. So, uh, that's just one quick way that I use to speed up my workflow because, uh, in a way doing this type, especially real estate photography, and I imagine portraits and, and all this other stuff, weddings and everything, it's all about time. And so, uh, I love editing photos. I could sit down, pop on some music, 
grab a beer and just sit at my computer all day long and just edit photos and just really get into the nitty gritty part of the photos, pixel peep and everything. I don't, I, I, I love editing as much as I love taking the photo. But when it comes to, you know, the, the money you get versus the time that it takes you to get the photo, you want to make sure you're making money and not just wasting your time. So I want to spend as quick, as less of time as possible editing the photos that I need to get to the client. And then if I want to go back and use my own time to just kind of play with the photos, then that's, that's what I'll do. I'll, I'll do that away from, uh, after I deliver the, the photos to the, to the client. And so, uh, that's just, just some quick seven examples of how I uh, improve my workflow. So I talked about the, I'm going to get into the widget of the week here. I talked about a, uh, cool thing that I found and, uh, actually Petapixel, um, actually talked about it on one of the recent articles I found, but it's basically a Google for NASA. And so, uh, I, if you go to, let me pull up the website here. It is images.com or no images.nasa.gov. If you go to images.nasa.gov, you're going to be greeted with a really awesome page and it's a video image and audio search of NASA's library. You can search anything and everything on the, uh, the photos that NASA has taken. Uh, there's all kinds of awesome photos. Um, you got launching, you got the people, uh, the, almost every kind of launch you can think of. You got the people talking in the control room. You got background noise that you can see and hear and everything. Uh, it's just it's such a great thing. If you just type in the word launch, which I just uh, I just did now, you're going to get, uh, for example, you're going to get um, sound of the Apollo 11 missions, uh, liftoff. You're going to get countdowns. You're going to get all the launches that you can find here. Uh, you're going to get background uh, background images, um, interviews with, uh, certain astronauts and everything. It's, it, you're, you're basically searching all NASA has. <laughs> and it's a really, really awesome site. It's very easy to use. You can, uh, you can search by time period. Um, it's just, it's just a really awesome thing. And I've probably played with this way longer than I should have just because I've been looking at stuff like this. So if you're really into astrophotography or just really awesome photos, basically, uh, go to images.nasa.gov. Uh, if you're driving or whatever, go to picturemonk.com slash PMP078 and a link will be there for you just in case. Uh, but yeah, fantastic site. I'm glad they did this because they had a site before that was really, um, underwhelming, I think, <laughs> but it looks like they, they changed it up a little bit. So really great site. If you want to check that out again, images.nasa.gov. All right, guys, thank you for joining me in this week's podcast. Uh, thanks again for those who have uh, been supportive with the whole uh, new little video series thing. Uh, it means a lot, guys. I really do appreciate that. And uh, look out for more. I'll have another one coming up next week, hopefully, if I can get it edited in time. And that's it. Uh, have a great week, guys, and uh, keep taking some awesome photos and sharing them on the Picture Monk Nation page. Love seeing those and uh, spread the word. So thanks, guys. Uh, this is Jordan from PictureMonk.com, and I'll see you later.